Now, one of the things you're going to find as we go through the book of Revelation, you've noticed this already, I'm sure, is that many of the great themes of this book are repeated many times and in many different ways. For example, back in chapter 6, verse 1, we got our first look at the one that John calls in his epistle the Antichrist. There, he's presented as one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Do you remember that study? It's a long time back, but it was, it was a powerful study. In our chapter today, we get to see the Antichrist again, but in greater detail and from a different perspective. Now, in verse 1 of chapter 13, John says he was standing on the sand of the sea. And as he watched the sea, can you visualize this? This incredible beast, Therion in the Greek, rises up out of the sea. Notice how John describes it. The beast had seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns were ten crowns. On his head was a blasphemous name. The beast himself was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. And his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. Folks, this is a wild creature. Now we know what John is seeing here is the Antichrist rising up in the fullness of his power during the last 42 months or three and a half years of the Great Tribulation period. Now, has the Antichrist been on the scene in the three and a half years before this? Oh, you know he has. But now his full power and his true colors are about to be revealed. Now what you have to understand here is that what John is seeing in this piece is both a man and an empire that the beast represents. Turn over to Revelation chapter 17, if you would, please. A few chapters over. And look at verse 8. And here John gets another description, again, of this beast. He says, The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five has fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. And the beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth. And is of the seventh and is going to perdition. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as the kings were the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. Now look up again at verse 9. Verse 9 tells us that the seven heads of the beast represent the seven mountains, which are the headquarters of this woman who is riding the beast. Now if you're back in John's day, and you read this, and John talked about a city that was built upon seven hills or seven mountains, everyone knew what that was. What city is that? See, even you know that today. They knew it back then. So the empire that the beast represents, listen, this is important. The empire that the beast represents is a revised Roman empire. The man that's represented by the beast is going to be the seventh in the line of the Roman rulers that had come before him, according to verses 10 and 11. Verse 12 tells us that the ten horns represent those that will come into power with him as this revised Roman Empire begins to emerge. So the Antichrist is going to emerge out of a ten-nation confederation that's going to be a rebuilt Roman Empire. Now, at least you think I'm being a little hasty in my interpretation here. I want you to turn back to Daniel chapter 2, back in the Old Testament. Some of you haven't been there in a long time. For those pages are all stuck together back there. It's to the right of Psalms. Daniel chapter 2. Here, King Nebuchadnezzar sees a dream. Daniel comes in to tell him the dream and interpret it. Here's what he says. And you, O king, were watching, and behold, the great image, this great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you. Its form was awesome. 
This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs were of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone that was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff. From the summer threshing floor, the wind carrying them away, so there was no trace of them found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. Now Daniel's interpretation of this dream is that each part of this image. Can, can you see it? If not, we've got a picture of it up there for you so you can see it. This image represents the world kingdoms that were to come. It began with the Babylonian Empire, the head of gold, which was Nebuchadnezzar himself. But see, his kingdom would be replaced by the Medo-Persian Empire, which would then be replaced by the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great, which would give way to the kingdom of iron, which would be who? Rome, exactly. Now, the last world empire, do you see it? Will be a revision of the iron empire, the Roman. Only this time, it would be a kingdom made up of nations that were both Weak and strong, symbolized by the feet of iron and what else? Clay. And it would be this empire that would be in place when this stone that was made without hands would come out of heaven and destroy the kingdom established by man and replace it with the rule of God. Now the stone that comes from heaven that's cut without hands is who? It's Jesus. But team, write this down specifically. It's Jesus Christ at his second coming. It's Jesus coming in power. He wipes out the kingdoms of men and replaces it with the kingdom of God. Now, since you're still in the book of Daniel, and I know you like the book of Daniel, turn over to Daniel chapter 7, verse 2. Let's look at another vision that Daniel had. Daniel 7, verse 2. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision. This is a vision given right, to, given right to Daniel. By night, behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had an eagle's wings. I watched those wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. And then suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side, had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this, I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast. Dreadful. Terrible exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth that was devouring, breaking in pieces, trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. I was considering the horns. And there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man. And the mouth speaking pompous words. Now, what you have here is the same message as the first dream, isn't it? The first vision, but with different symbols. No longer is the statue made with different metals. No, these world kingdoms are now represented by these animal creatures. The Babylonian by the lion with the wings of an eagle. Medo-Persian by a bear who went out devouring much flesh. The Greeks by a leopard that will represent the speed and the power by which Alexander the Great would overtake the world. And the Roman Empire is pictured, notice, by a beast that's, beast that's so horrible. It can't even be described. Has iron teeth and feet that trampled everything in his path. But then notice, this beast has ten horns. And now the horn comes one little horn, who plucks out three of the other horns by their roots. And this little horn has the eyes of a man... And his voice, his mouth, speaks pompous words. You see how this all fits together? He fits together to show us that this beast represents a world leader that's going to emerge out of a revised Roman Empire. Now, what's interesting about all this is that there have been many attempts down through the ages to revise the Roman Empire. But you see, it was not God's timing yet. 
Charlemagne tried to do it and failed. The Muslims tried to revive it and put it under Islam. They failed. Napoleon tried and failed. Kaiser Wilhelm tried and failed. Hitler's great dream was to revise the Roman Empire with him as the leader of it. And he almost succeeded, but he still failed. But when the Antichrist comes on the scene, oh folks, he will not fail. He will succeed. His springboard will be this revised Roman Empire, and from it will come a one world economy, a one world religious system, and a one world government. Now, I remember the first time I heard about the Antichrist and his coming. I was just become a Christian. I was 18 years old. That was about, <laughs> I think it was like 50 years ago. And they, I heard it. They said, look, a couple of things have to happen before the Antichrist can come. The first is that the two superpowers, America and Russia, have to become not superpowers. And then Western Europe would have to come together into a strong economic force in the world. And I remember back then thinking, American and Russia ceasing to be superpowers? The countries in Western Europe getting together? Bet me that any one of those would happen. But from then to now, some radical things have taken place, haven't they? The Russian Republic has collapsed, leaving behind Putin and Mother Russia, still powerful, but not as powerful as it was. And now we have a united Western Europe, a European Union, with their own currency, a united backing system, which makes them one of the strongest economic forces in the world. And in our country, you've had three presidents in a row that have aggressively moved our country towards a global mentality, economically, politically. And of course, now you have President Obama, who's doing all that he can to weaken America's standing in the world. Folks, if you think all this is coincidence, you are kidding yourselves. You're kidding yourself. You're kidding yourself. The stage is being set for the man of sin, the Antichrist, to come. Now, turn back to Revelation chapter 13. Last book of the Bible. Easy to find. Last time we talked about the Antichrist, we saw his rise to power would come through economic means. Isn't that interesting? Not through war, right? Not through elections, but through economic means. The world is going to get itself in an economic bind, and this man is going to come on the scene with a solution. You say, well, could that happen in our world today? Folks, what happened last week? China's stock market has a hiccup, and the world is on life support, right? Man, listen, there's going to be an economic crisis that happens in our world. This guy is going to step in with a plan that will blow everyone's mind. Not only that, but in the process, he's going to bring peace where there's been no peace, specifically in the Middle East. He's going to bring prosperity where there has been only hurting and destruction. In effect, the world is going to hail this man as the Messiah, as their Savior. Now, in the midst of that, watch what happens. This is amazing. Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. Now, we're not given the details of how this happens, but somehow there's going to be an attempt on this man's life, and it will appear to the world that he is dead. What a blow that's going to be to the world. I mean, when the world finally has their man, it's got their savior, got their Messiah, the world is finally on track. It all crumbles because their Messiah is dead. Oh, but then something miraculous happens. Something supernatural happens. The deadly wound is healed. This guy is brought back to life. To get the full impact of this, you have to look at verse 4. So they worship the... Who? The dragon. Who's the dragon? Are you sure? Yeah. Satan. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? See, there's no doubt the world is going to know that it was the devil that healed this man. Now, they might not perceive him as being the devil like we know him from Scripture, but they'll understand this man's life and power came from this being. 
So much so, they will worship the devil and they will worship the beast saying, who's like the beast? And who can make war with him? Boy, I guess so. If the power behind him can heal him from a mortal wound, man, this guy is indestructible. Who can defeat him? Now, what I want you to see right here is that this is the beginning of an unholy trinity. I've, I've always told you, Satan wants to counterfeit everything God does. Here's his counterfeit trinity. You have the power behind the Antichrist, who is the devil in the role of God the Father. You have a Messiah, the Antichrist, that's been apparently raised from the dead, just like Jesus. All you need now is one like the Holy Spirit. And folks, he's coming. We're going we're to see him right here in our chapter. Now, I say this because there's going to be a shift in this man's focus. The Antichrist was first concerned about an economic statement, a political statement of the world. He makes it. It's amazing. The world buys it. Now he's concerned about making a spiritual statement to the world. Look at verse 5. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in a blasphemous way against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe and tongue and nation. So at the three and a half year mark in the tribulation, everything changes. It changes. It goes from the tribulation to the great tribulation. The Antichrist has now given great authority to blaspheme against God, his name, his tabernacle, and all who dwell in heaven. See, make no mistake. The Antichrist is going to come up as being a very spiritual person. But his spirituality will have no room for Christianity. Imagine that. This one, who at one time embraced all religion, will begin to change his tune and will blaspheme the true God, but doesn't stop with just talk. It's not long before he makes an open season on true believers. He makes war with those who have received Christ during the tribulation period, and this war is very effective. Now, what's amazing is that the more he persecutes the saints of God, the more the people in the world love him. Look at verse 8. And all... You see that word? All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Folks, at this point, it's going to be a clear line drawn between two groups of people. Do you see it? It's clear. Those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life and those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. Folks, that's how God sees our world. That's how he sees it. Okay? Those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, those who have given their lives to Christ, are going to be able to discern who this man of sin is. They will know he's the Antichrist. They will not worship him. Those who have not been born from above, those whose names are not in the Lamb's Book of Life, they will fall for this man, hook, line, and sinker. And as we'll see for in a minute, those who do worship the Antichrist will benefit from his rule. Those who will not worship him will come under his wrath. That leads us into verse 9. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who led, leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now, a couple things I want you to notice here. First, John uses a phrase that should be familiar to you. Jesus used it a lot in the very beginning of the book of Revelation. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. But only this time, part of the phrase is left out. Remember, Jesus said, if anyone has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the, to the churches. But that last phrase is now left out. Why? Because the church is no longer on planet Earth. The church is no longer here. This word of encouragement is for those who made a decision for Jesus after the church has been raptured out of here. And what's the encouragement? Well, it's pretty sober, isn't it? What the Spirit of God is saying to those who will read this, remember, this is during the tribulation period when all this stuff is coming down. Those who will read it will hear that the ones that have taken them captive, the ones that have killed them and their loved ones with the sword, 
will also be taken into captivity and will also face the sword in God's presence. What the Spirit is reminding them of here is what the Spirit reminded the Old Testament saints of and the New Testament saints of. God says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. I will repay. There's going to be justice for the saints of God. Now, you know, th th that doesn't mean much to us sitting here in Kapalua, Maui, 2016. But think of, about being in the middle of the tribulation with the Antichrist, height of his power. Think about what these words will mean to them. Well, that, that, that should put our lives in perspective today, shouldn't it? Well, that brings us to verse 11, where we see another interesting character that's going to join up with the Antichrist. In verse 11, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Now, there's no doubt that this beast, same Greek word, by the way, used it for beast, Therion, it's another beast of exactly the same type. But this one is not political. It is spiritual. And that's what John is getting at when he says that it had the appearance of a lamb. Now, the spirit that is in him is not from God, but from the dragon. John tells us his mouth gives him away. Notice that the beast comes up out of the earth. Well, the Antichrist arose out of the sea, right? Now, the sea is always a picture of the Gentile nation. So there's a good chance here that the Antichrist is going to be a Gentile. But the earth could also be a picture of what? This is kind of a hard one, but... Many believe it might be a reference to Israel, meaning that the false prophet here who supports the beast could be Jewish. It's just speculation. His purpose is very clearly outlined in verse 12. And he executes all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Now see, this guy's whole purpose is to turn the worship of the whole world towards the Antichrist. And isn't this what the devil and the Antichrist have always wanted? They wanted the world to worship them as God. They're going to get it. Now, he does it first by exercising the Antichrist's full authority. But then secondly, by signs, wonders, and miracles. His most dramatic one, he makes fire come down from heaven in the presence of men. Let me tell you something about this man's power. It is going to be really, really, really convincing. He's going to do miracles that will blow people's minds. And every miracle will be additional proof that the Antichrist is worthy of worship. Can I tell you what this teaches us? Listen, church. The devil has miracle working powers. You know, people see something supernatural and they think, well, that, that must be from God. Not necessarily so. Here you have a man that's from the pit of hell doing great signs and wonders that equal those done by the prophets of God. You know, one of the enemy's best ploys is to deceive the people of God with signs and wonders, or at least apparent signs and wonders. Here he uses them to dupe the entire world. But then the false prophet, prophet does something else that's really amazing. And that is he convinces the people of the earth to make an image to the Antichrist so that people can worship him even when he's not present with them. Now, many believe that this image is going to be set up in Jerusalem. They think his political headquarters will be Rome. His spiritual headquarters will be Jerusalem, perhaps even in the temple itself. So when he's absent from Jerusalem, they still have this image to worship. But it doesn't stop there. Once this image is up, the false prophet is able to make it come alive. Look at verse 15. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now the Greek word here translated breath is pneuma, which just means breath. It's not the Greek word zoe, which means life. So although this image doesn't really come to life, it looks and acts life. it's alive. Now, I've had people say, see, it's going to be just like 
Mr. Lincoln in Disneyland. That's how he's going to do this. But folks, that is ancient technology. Do you know Mr. Lincoln's not even at Disneyland anymore? He's gone. No, what is going to happen here? Folks, this is going to be supernatural. This is going to be so good that the world is going to worship this image like it's alive. And if they don't, what happens? Yeah, they're, they're, they're going to be killed. Now, watch what the false prophet does next in verse 16. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, so that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. What's his number? That's where it comes from. It comes from right here. We're going to find that out a little bit later on. Okay? So here's how the Antichrist gains complete control of the earth. He prevents anyone from doing business, buying or selling, without his mark on them. Unless they are totally identified with him, they can't survive on planet Earth. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Folks, this was written 2,000 years ago. Okay, 2,000 years ago. Up until about 50 years ago, this just didn't make sense. How could one man prevent any other man or woman, any place on the globe, from buying or selling? It just wasn't possible. It couldn't happen. But now, you know, this is exactly what our world is heading towards. Not only does the technology exist to put a mark on now, probably underneath your hand or your forehead, but it's what we really need. Do you know you could stop the drug trade in its tracks if you could get rid of cash? You could cut crime in half if you could get rid of cash? You could save the federal government millions of dollars if you could track electronically every transaction that was made. Cash, a cashless society is so practical. It's so 21st century. And you know it's exactly where we're headed. Here's a little challenge for you. Go home today, type in cashless society into Google, see what comes up. It'll, it'll blow your mind how far and how close we are to having this happen in our world. But it's just one more thing that sets the stage for the man of sin to rally the world around him. So folks, that's what God says is going to happen. That's what God says is coming. Now, we, we've talked about this for half an hour. You have to admit, this is pretty wild stuff, isn't it? Amen. It's pretty wild, right? And, and you can hear this and say, man, that's God's view. That's the Bible view of our future. That's wacky. That's how to lunch. That will never happen. That's in La La Land. Or you could hear that and you could say, wow, that was written 2,000 years ago? Man, God knows exactly what he's talking about. He knows exactly what's going to come down in our future. Folks, these things make sense to us today like no other generation. We hear this and we say, yeah, of course, sure, yeah, absolutely. See, I think it's the latter. I think it makes sense. Here's why. God doesn't dwell in time and space. God dwells in eternity. He dwells in that place where Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. For God, predicting the future is like us predicting what happened yesterday. If you be like me ever saying, hey, church, I got a prediction. I got it. Donald Trump, remember the star from The Apprentice? Donald Trump is going to run for president, and he'll actually be leading in all the polls, leading into the first primaries. See, that'd be your reaction. You'd be going, yeah, duh, Pastor, right. Why? Because it's already happened. It's old news. You know that. But see, for God, who's outside of time and space and eternity, everything in time and space is old news. Everything. He's seen the whole movie of planet Earth from beginning to end. So what he's recorded in his word is absolutely going to come down. The question is, are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? Oh, you can know it, but are you ready? How do you get ready? Your name has to be written in the Lamb's book of life. Not your parents' name, not your pastor's name, not your spouse's name, 
No. Your name, your name has to be written in the Lamb's book of life. It's as simple as opening up your heart and inviting him in.